Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Fawzia Khan. I'm professor and consultant anesthesiologist in the Department of Anesthesiology, Aga Khan University and Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this first ASPA-FLEX-3 webinar of 2023. And uh, this, is, uh, these are, uh, uh, this is regarding neonatal anesthesia. The uh, program has three case-based discussions. Uh, first is tracheoesophageal fistula with duodenal atresia. Then it follows with a case of omphalocele. And the third one is a premature neonate with sepsis and perforated gut. Now let uh, me, uh, let's go through some housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, um, how can you ask questions or share your comments? We'd like you to send in your questions via the question and answer section chat and raise hand functions are disabled. Our moderators will highlight your questions to the appropriate speaker during the panel discussion. Some questions will be answered by text with appropriate uh, speaker. Uh, the certificate, uh, the, the certificate of attendance, uh, this will be automatically generated and forward it to those who submit the post-webinar survey only. And this will be forwarded to you tomorrow, that is January 16th, 2023, at 1700 hours uh, Singapore time through email. Now, please ensure that you have correctly keyed in your full name and your email. Uh, we would also request you to visit our website, and to like us on Facebook and follow us on YouTube and search us for Espaflex. Now let me introduce you to our uh, moderators and speakers. First of all, our webinar IT support is uh, provided uh, by Dr. Uh, uh, its support is provided uh, by Dr. Vivian Yuan. And she's a consultant in chief of service, Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at the Hong Kong's Children's Hospital. Our moderator, the first moderator is Dr. Agnes Singh. She's a senior consultant, Department of Pediatric Anesthesia, KK Women and Children's Hospital in Singapore. Our second moderator, is Dr. Vishali Pandey. She's uh, National President and Founder Secretary, Academy of Regional Anesthesia in India. She is also Director of Children's Anesthesia Services in Mumbai. And she's Program Head of WFSA Children's Anesthesia Service, Services, ISA, and uh, the Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Fellowship in Mumbai. She is part of the Education Committee of WFSA Pediatric Anesthesia. Our panelists include a pediatric surgeon, which is Dr. Gursev Sandlis, and he, his present designation is that he's a consultant pediatric surgeon. Uh, he's a minimal access laparoscopy and robotic surgery specialist, and he works for Jess Lok Hospital and Research Center. Surya Children's Hospital and Sefi Hospital. And his interests are in minimal excess surgery in children involving both laparoscopic and robotic approach. And he heads the only comprehensive pediatric robot robotic surgery program in Western India. Our next speaker is Dr. Sharina Isaac. Uh, she's a neonatologist. She is Associate Professor and Consultant Neonatologist, Department of Pediatric Faculty of Medicine, University of Kibangsan in Malaysia. And her interests are neonatal brain, neonatal imaging, and neonatal growth and nutrition. 
Our third panelist today is Dr. Olivia Vijavira. She's a pediatric anesthesiologist and she is a senior consultant pediatric anesthetist in Singapore with KK Women and Children Hospital. She completed her fellowship with uh, Birmingham Children's Hospital in UK in 2013 and has an interest in pediatric cardiac anesthesia as well as overseas Smile uh, Asia missions. Her interest outside of providing smooth anesthesia care to her patients, she favors them with lollipops and Lego. She is a foodie, a shopaholic, and a Formula One enthusiast, occasionally giving it a go at sim racing. And our final panelist today is Dr. Christine Perezio, and she's uh, again a pediatric anesthesiologist. She's chief of section of pediatric anesthesiology, Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine, University of Santo Thomas Hospital in Philippines. And uh, she's an active consultant uh, also at the University of Santo Thomas Hospital, Cardinal Santos Medical Center. Thank you. This was the introduction of our fourth panelist, and I'll hand over to the first moderator now to take over to take us over the first case. Thank you. Hello, I'm Agnes. A warm welcome to all in the audience and who choose to spend part of your Sunday with us. And also a warm welcome to our panelists of experts. So this is our first case, a male baby, full term, with a tracheal esophageal atresia and duodenal atresia. Echo shows a PDA, a large ASD and mild pulmonary hypertension, scheduled for a two-year-old repair on day two. I'll pass now over to Gersif, our pediatric surgeon, to just share the surgical aspects of TOF with us. Gersif, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Agnes. So uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, I'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Can we? Uh, yeah. So uh, I think all of us know the four types of five types of tracheoesophageal fistulas. And uh, I think what we would be more concerned would be the type three, where you have the proximal atresia followed by uh, the lower end, which is connected to the esophagus, uh, to the trachea. The esophagus is connected to the trachea. Uh, typically, we would take x-rays of these kids, um, one to look for uh, associated anomalies like you have duodenal atresia in this patient. And the second case uh, would be to rule out pure esophageal atresia. Um, primary concern for us would be uh, the condition of the lungs, uh, whether there's any sepsis, because uh, tracheosophageal fistula, though, um, is not really a true medical emo a surgical emergency. We would rather optimize the child first before proceeding with surgery in such cases. So the uh, routine x-rays, a septic workup in these kids uh, would be my primary concerns uh, before opting for a repair. The uh, question whether to go for a thoracoscopic repair or an open repair would be dictated by basically two factors. One primary factor would be the condition of the lungs. If the child has presented to us early and there is no aspiration pneumonitis uh, and the child is otherwise maintaining saturation on uh, minimal supports, proceed with the thoracoscopic repair. Um, otherwise, uh, an open repair is preferable, uh, giving a better ventilation to the child because thoracoscopic repair could cause a positive pressure in the thorax. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see uh, cases of pure esophageal atresia where there won't be any gas shadows in the abdomen. So um, as a surgeon, my primary concern, like I said, would be the timing of the surgery and what approach uh, we would prefer, whether it would be a thoracoscopic approach or, a, or an open approach, depending upon uh, the overall uh, condition of the child. Thank you. Okay, can we have the gallery view now? All right, um, Sharina, our neonatologist, perhaps you could share with us how you would you optimize a baby as such? Uh, but before the surgery. Right, okay, thank you, Agnes. Um, the main uh, dilemma or problem for us if, is if the patient has caught a fistula, a tracheoesophageal fistula, because maintaining optimum ventilation and oxygenation would be a major problem for us. Um, ideally, uh, we wouldn't want the patient to be on non invasive ventilation, but that will cause further distension of the abdomen and that will impede ventilation um, further 
Um, so that's one uh, issue that we have. So we must ascertain uh, immediately whether there is a fistula um, connected between the trachea and the esophagus. Right. The other thing will be because of the blind esophageal pouch, there will be a lot of accumulation of secretions in the upper airway. So um, that will further uh, impede ventilation and oxygenation. So if the surgery is not done uh, early, uh, one way of reducing the amount of secretion in the upper airway is to put in a ripple tube, which is inserted into the blind end of the esophageal pouch. Um, that will help to um, reduce the risk of the baby aspirating and that may delay surgery if the baby should aspirate. Um, the other thing would be to maintain um, a, a slightly higher um, head elevation at about maybe 30 degrees, right? So that, that would help uh, with the ripple tube to help the secretion to accumulate in the esophageal pouch and that will help us clear up the secretions uh, as much as possible. The other thing is if um, a new unit has got a congenital anomaly, we always have to look out for other congenital malformations that may or may not have been picked up antenatally. If it has been picked up antenatally, then it will make our job easier because we know what are the anomalies present. But if it's not uh, there, one of the things that we do early is uh, an echocardiogram, right? Uh, so we look at the cardiac structures as well as looking at the site of the aorta whether it's a right-sided or a left-sided aorta. Um, uh, in my center, I, I think that would help the surgeon decide the entry, right? Uh, if it's a right-sided or a left-sided aorta. And uh, there are some syndromes or associations that's uh, associated with tracheoesophageal fistula or esophageal atresia. And one of the more common ones is the vectoral association, where they have um, vertebral anomalies, they have the tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal atresia. They have renal anomalies, limb malformations. Um, so these are the things that we look out for. So we do a renal ultrasound. We do um, a spinal x-ray, which can be done later because it will not um, interfere with the acute management of the patient. So the, the main important thing, uh, I think, would be the ventilation problem. Okay, thanks, Sharina. Um, um, this question is And for optimizing the ventilation also. Yes. Um, for Gersif, oftentimes we find that the fistula is very close to the carina, isn't it? And um, I'm just, that would be a surgical uh, a ventilation question which I pose to the anesthetist. But the other thing is, that oftentimes our surgeon asks to isolate the fistula. Do you do that? Do you request uh, or do you actually isolate the fistula? Uh, not really, Agnes. Um, I mean, it's very difficult one to isolate the fistula to begin with. Uh, technically itself, it's very demanding for the anesthetist. Secondly, uh, as a surgeon, it doesn't really um, help me uh, in any way if I am able to uh, isolate the fistula because what we generally would prefer, uh, like you said, if it's very close to the carina, then anyway, there is going to be, uh, you know, as whenever you ventilate, there is going to be air which is going into the fistula and then into the stomach. If the fistula is slightly away, we can ask the anesthetist to position it in such a way that there is minimal air entry into the fistula and consequently into the stomach because it's counterproductive. The more gas that enters the stomach, it's going to splint the diaphragm, it's going to make ventilation more difficult. And, and we really can't solve that problem till I have disconnected the fistula and then uh, you know deflated the stomach by putting in a feeding tube. So mm -hmm. as a protocol, we would not isolate the fistula uh, okay. just from a surgical standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Olivia, I can call you Oli. Um, Sometimes the surgeons do ask us, right, to, 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 to um, or rather they do the, uh, the isolation, right, you know. And um, so how, how do you anesthetize the child to, to give them a good feel for them to be able to insert the Fogarty? I see. So um, at our institution, it is uh, fairly routine for the pediatric surgeons or with the assistance of the ENT surgeons to isolate the fistulas, and we do it routinely for almost uh, all tracheoesophageal fistulas. Um, as a result for us, uh, the surgery and anesthesia first starts with a rigid bronchoscopy or microlaryngal bronchoscopy as you term it. And so for that, oftentimes uh, we will inhale the child for sleep, make sure that the child is at an adequate depth of anesthesia. We then topicalize the airway and we maintain spontaneous ventilation throughout uh, the procedure. 
and then the surgeon will insert a size three progressive catheter um, down the fistula when it is uh, visualized. Okay, so what are the reasons given by the surgeons uh, that they want us to, or, or rather they want to isolate the fistula? Um, so the reasons that have been cited would be actually for them intraoperatively, um, after turning the patient lateral, they are able to use the Fogarty catheter to, uh, as a guide to where the fistula is to help them feel the fistula surgically. And um, the other one is that for the large, larger carinal fistulas that are very close to the current, where it's almost uh, impossible to uh, really isolate the fistula, uh, where it can cause some ventilatory problems, then the, Fogarty, the tip of the Fogarty catheter often has a balloon and we can potentially inflate the balloon if we have uh, encountered difficulties with ventilation and gastric distension. Is it, has it, have you had challenges in it slipping out? The Fogarty catheter? Yes, during the surgery. Yes. Um, it hasn't really slipped out and thankfully I've never really had to uh, inflate the balloon because of uh, severe ventilatory challenges, but it does have to be taped very, very well. Yeah, okay. So whenever we turn the patient from a supine to a lateral posi position, I always make sure that I tape it properly and I hang on to it for dear life make sure that it doesn't get this lot. I also actually do use a marker to ink up where it's supposed to end at the mouth so that the marking doesn't disappear or I know that if it's kind of become dislodged uh, upon turning the patient lateral. Okay, all right. Um, Christine, what are the other anesthesia challenges you face, um, you know, uh, uh, managing these babies going for tough repair? So uh, the definitive um, anesthetic management of, uh, must be carefully planned and in the light of uh, uh, the TF, uh, the location and the size of the fistula must be known prior to the operation, um, the concurrent respiratory status, as mentioned earlier, and the existing illnesses of the newborn. So it was said that 50% uh, of patients with TF um, have, um, are associated with Bactro, and Dr. Farina has um, um, uh, mentioned it earlier, um, and in our patient, it was seen to have a PBA, an ASD, and a pulmonary hypertension, so that it was good, that it was uh, an echocardiographic evaluation was uh, prior to the operation was done, and ideally, a hemodynamic study should uh, be done to measure the different chamber, the different pressure in the chambers of the heart, and also, if possible, intra-arterial and CVP lines. Um, aside from the ASA standard monitors should be placed. Also, the e-kit or the rescue drugs must be within reach at all times. Also, the management of the airway, as mentioned earlier, is a crucial element in the anesthetic care of the newborn with DF. So the objective is to secure the airway in such a manner that the gas inflow into the gastrointestinal tract via the TEF is minimized while avoiding aspiration and uh, uh, over gastric uh, content. So, um, over gastric inflation will, uh, number one, limit your diaphragmatic um, excursion. It will also compromise your ventilation. It will also um, increase your intra-abdominal pressure and subsequently it will decrease your cardiac output. So inhalational anesthesia with spontaneous ventilation has uh, been um, uh, employed during induction until ligation of the fistula in order to minimize gastric insufflation. However, um, with patients um, uh, with small fistula or those patients with uh, less than uh, uh, or equal to three millimeter uh, diameter, they can be given positive pressure ventilation or a gentle bag uh, ventilation, and it's relatively safe uh, for gastric insufflation. Uh, however, um, you should take into consideration that the inspiratory pressure should be kept low. And also the controversial use of neuromuscular blocker. Some say it should be given at um, um, uh, towards the ligation of, at the end of the ligation of the fistula. But for small fistula, um, you may not wait until the ligation of the fistula. Another is that the accurate uh, ETT positioning um, Alternative strategies ensuring adequate ventilation include the tracheal intubation distal to the fistula, which we uh, often uh, do 
for, as mentioned earlier, an, uh, an uh, occlusion of the fistula by a uh, Fogarty catheter. Also, um, if you're doubtful of your position, if, and if your institution has a bronchoscope, it should be it could be handy to have the bronchoscope in your operating theater and if there's a need to refer to your uh, ENT or it's a pulmonary uh, a pediatric pulmonologist please do so so it's just for the safety of the baby so how do you how do we ensure the adequate ventilation so we could do ABGs intraoperatively and so that we can evaluate the adequate uh, pulmonary ventilation and the saturation of the baby and until the ligation of the fistula is completed and there should be a, a, a constant communication with your surgeon and there, uh, you should discuss with the surgeon what are the uh, what's the definitive plan are they going to do a thoracoscopic repair or a, an open thoracotomy because it will definitely um, affect the uh, the baby because if uh, for thoracotomies we all know that the lungs can be um, it can be compressed, it can be retracted, there can be contusion. So uh, for how uh, meanwhile for thoracoscopic repair, the surgical insufflation also of the carbon dioxide may um, do, uh, give about hypercapnia and eventually um, uh, bring about the saturation. So. Um, I think the key here is uh, vigilance and uh, uh, a quick response and inform your surgeon about uh, what is happening to the baby. Okay, and, all right. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you, you brought up about, um, you know, the, the talking to the surgeon, which I think, um, you know, Joseph, do you have any little uh, um, concerns? You know, for the anesthetist when you are doing the surgery, perhaps, you know, briefly you can share with us your, your concerns. That we should be looking out for? Yeah, I think the main concern would be uh, if we are doing a thoracoscopic repair would be uh, the ventilation because it's going to cause a positive thora intrathoracic pressure and uh, that can make uh, ventilation difficult. It can cause desaturation during the surgery itself. So um, that would be my primary concern. Uh, when coming to um, if it's an open repair, then we would more be concerned about uh, the lung compression causing a lot of secretions to come out. And, and, and you know, regular suctioning would be a, a good thing uh, to look for. The third thing I would be concerned would be uh, the positioning of the ET tube, uh, especially if we are not putting in a Fogarty's catheter, then the tube should be positioned in such a way that, you know, uh, there is optimal ventilation. And I think a, a very good communication between the anesthetist and uh, the surgeon throughout the surgery, not just um, during the planning of the surgery, but throughout the surgery uh, is, is the key to making sure that these kids are managed safely uh, throughout the surgery. Okay, all right, thank you. So Sharina, we often take these babies back intubated. Uh, you know, could you share with us, you know, how would you keep these babies quiet and, uh, and uh, your pain relief? Just briefly, yeah. yeah okay, so uh, the main thing rather than keeping them predated is to make sure that their pain control is optimized. Um, so rather than you know making them um, quiet from the sedation, it's actually to manage the pain uh, well. Um, so I would use uh, opiates as my first line and uh, interspace it with paracetamol, right? So that will help me to wean the opiates faster and uh, hopefully they're strong enough to be excavated into room air rather than putting them on a uh, high flow nasal cannula or nasal feedback, right? Um, so pain control is a very important thing uh, for, for neonates. Um, and if the pain control is, is uh, still uh, not well managed, then I will, I will consider some form of sedation uh, for these babies. And I would uh, probably use benzodiazepines because uh, we don't use much of the um, alpha 2 receptor agonist much uh, in, in Malaysia. All right. How long do you keep these babies intubated for? Um, last so it, question from me. Yeah. So it depends on how good the lungs are. And uh, so we look at their, their lung dynamics and see how strong they are. Okay. All right. Um, um, from the uh, on the spontaneous um, respiration. The lungs so are how long would you keep the would you recommend we keep the babies intubated for? 
Um, um, I think I think that's a call that the neonatologist and the anesthetist has to take. How long do we ventilate them? My primary concerns post-operative would be patient positioning uh, to make sure that there's no hyperextension of the neck, which happening, which is going to cause tension on the anastomosis. Secondly, uh, there should be regular suctioning orally, but not too deep a suctioning to go into the esophagus and again cause uh, you know issues with the anastomosis so patient positioning regular suctioning would be my two main concerns um, as far as ventilation goes uh, unless and until it's a very long gap uh, fistula where we have had a, a, a fairly tense anastomosis uh, and we do not want the baby to move that would be probably be the only surgical indication where i would ask for an elective ventilation for the next 24 hours or 48 hours but okay. apart from that, I think that's a call for the neonatologist and the anesthetist to take. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, panelists. Maybe I'll hand over to Vrishali. There are some questions that you might want to ask the panel. Yes, indeed, Agnes. We do have here extremely practical questions coming up. The first question is, uh, do you use cuffed or uncuffed tubes? And if we use cuffed endotracheal tubes, then how do you ensure that the cuff is not near the surgical site? Maybe, uh, Olivia, can you take this question? Uh, Olivia, yeah, yeah, please carry on. Olivia, please take oh. over. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, let me just have a look at the question again. Uh, uh, the question, really do you use cuffed yeah. or uncuffed tubes, Olivia? And if you use cuffed mm -hmm. tubes, then where do you have your cuff, in other words? Where do you see to it that you have Actually, your cuff? most of the time, these babies, they aren't very big. So we, I tend to use the uh, uncuffed tubes more than and cuff tubes for these units because by the time the fogarty catheter goes in right there really isn't so much space yeah. yes true sure get the point because olivia always has a fogarty in place as she said well coming to another question uh inhalational anesthesia if practiced and then spontaneous ventilation lateral position open chest until fistula is ligated is a rather difficult technique so could you please explain how do you do it which breathing circuit? What are your fresh gas flow, sevoplorin concentration? So could uh, could uh, Christine take it? Because Christine, I guess you had uh, described the spontaneous ventilation. For the induction of uh, anesthesia, yes. we usually uh, start with um, a, uh, a giving of your inhalation of anesthesia, a sevoplorin. Um, yes. It can be used to... Um, uh, to put the, the baby to sleep. Um, for the breathing circuit, um, because it's a two point, uh, a small baby, you usually use uh, uh, um, Jackson Reese. Yes. Um, the, the, the volume of the bag is completed. There's a computation for that. And also yes. the, uh, the fresh gas flow is, um, there's a computation on how to compete for your get, get fresh gas sure. flow. Sure. But it's usually, um, not less than uh, three liters per minute uh, sure. to prevent the um, your breathing uh, of, uh, of uh, sure. carbon dioxide and yeah. um, SIVO concentration. Um, it depends on the hemodynamic status of the baby, but um, yes. it's, uh, it's more than uh, one per uh, one volume percent usually. Sure. Um, maintain it at one volume to two volume. I think two to three volume percent is more than enough for the baby sure, because sure. we have um, um, an adjunct like we've given fentanyl and op sure. uh, or morphine or other uh, intraoperative um, sure. analgesia. Definitely, the SIBO concentration will go down. So just sure. look into your hemodynamic status and titrate your gases and your um, drugs accordingly. Sure. So play it by case to case. And if you are you have a GR circuit in hand, then you can always adjust the ventilation in accordance to what the surgeon is doing so that the lung doesn't pop in their field when they right. work. So yes. Uh, so are you trying to tell us that you would give a muzzle relaxant after the inhalational induction? Is this what I you're trying to tell us? I usually don't uh, give you muscle usually. relaxant. I, uh, I just do spontaneous ventilation and until the ligation of the fistula. Sometimes I give a... a a small volume positive pressure ventilation sure. um just to support the uh, the ventilation all right thing. so uh, order, get, get get your thoughts uh, there is another question here in some centers like us is the questioner trying to ask us they do they do not do the bronchoscopy 
could ET position help with surgeons putting a tube to deflate the stomach? So, uh, in anyone may could answer this question. Maybe Olivia. Sorry, I actually had uh, replied this directly on the Q and A. Okay, but okay. I have some trouble understanding the second half of the question. Oh, the I'm not sure what it means by the ET position to help the surgeon put a tube to deflate the stomach. Oh, I'm well. not really sure. Yeah, I, I yes, I understand what you, what you're trying to say. In other words, are they trying to put ET in the fistula? Well, I'm not too sure. How would they guide it, anyways? There. So maybe they want to go beyond the fistula. In other words, they want to put the tube in endotracheal tube tip beyond the fistula so that the fistula is not ventilated. Is 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 the questioner asking this? Could you just? Put it on the chat so that Dr. Olivia can uh, can make her point clear to you once your point is clear to her. So I leave it to the chat box. Now, the, the last question, would you recommend intra-arterial pressure monitoring to this patient? Christine, could you take this question? Yes, um, I think we recommend um, intra-arterial pressure monitoring, especially with patients who have uh, big cardiac defects. And um, yeah, we should... Uh, Arterial pressure monitoring. Yes. Usually, that's with a female. So, if, if there are any more questions, I would rather request the audience to put it in the chat box and be sure that the questions would be answered there. So, can we just sum up this case? Okay, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take over. I'll just sum up this case then. Can we have the outcome of the. Of the um, Okay, so what has happened was that there was a thoracoscopic repair of the duodenal atresia and TOF. The patient was done under a G with lumbar epidural. Baby was electively ventilated, extubated 36 hours, epidural removed 48 hours. By day 11, the patient was back on full feet. Okay, all right. Now we go on to the second case, and Vushali will take a uh, hostess. Uh, yes, we come to a second case, which is antenatally diagnosed. Very very uncommon, but not so uncommon. We do see it uh, off and on. Antenatally diagnosed omphalocele, and of course, the parents have had been uh, under counseling since then. Born 36 weeks, 1.9 kilogram male baby, and now is scheduled for surgery. So over to Gursaif, uh, so that he can tell us the nuances of the surgical issue. Uh, so yeah, oh, um, thank you. Thank you, Vishali ma'am. Uh, so for omphalocele, I think uh, the primary concern, first of all, as soon as the baby is born, would be um, what are the contents? Uh, because every time liver is a part of the content of these omphalocele's, it it uh, it precludes towards a difficult surgical repair and probably a, a, a stormy post-operative course as well. So that's the first thing. Second thing we would be concerned about as a surgeon would be what is the thickness of this membrane on top, which is covering the exomphalos. Because if that membrane is thin, um, is it liable to burst? Because as, as long as the membrane is intact, everything inside is sterile, and we would like to keep it that way. So either you can put a silo or you can apply certain epithelizing agents to kind of thicken the sac and protect the sac from opening up. Uh, because omphalocytes like uh, the ones which we are showing you right now, they're, they're, they're just too big to be operated or repaired immediately. But we would want this baby to grow a little bit, um, you know, put on some weight and, and then proceed with surgery. Because um, frankly, in these cases, the problems will begin once the surgery is over. Because once all these contents are back inside the abdomen, it's going to cause raised intra-abdominal pressure, it's going to cause abdominal compartment syndrome, it's going to interfere with the renal blood supply, look at the urine output of these babies. So uh, the destabilizing uh, will begin after surgery as well. So where preoperatively we are concerned with management of the sac, prevention of sepsis, uh, postoperatively we would be concerned about the abdominal compartment syndromes. So uh, as a surgeon, my primary endeavor is to make sure that the sac remains intact. I may cover it with a silo and then proceed till the child becomes old enough for us to electively go ahead and operate on this child. All right. Uh, Dr. Serena, could you, could you just put some light on the management in the NICU prior to the child going in the operation theater? All right. Okay. 
So um, if a child is, is born with a medium phallocele, that means the liver is in the sac, that's called a medium phallocele, uh, most of the time there is a high association with pulmonary hypoplasia. So that's something that we really have to look for and assess the respiratory status uh, on admission to the NICU. And uh, omphalocele is more likely to be associated with an underlying genetic abnormality as compared to the other um, gut abnormality like gastroclysis. So uh, we do tend to do a full examination looking for underlying abnormalities. So things like trisomy 13, 18, which are usually not compatible with life. So if it's that, if it's if, it, uh, if a trisomy is the case, then most likely we will go more towards conservative management rather than active management. Um, there are other genetic uh, or underlying genetic syndromes that may be associated uh, that we have to look for. So uh, again, cardiac, uh, echocardiogram, renal ultrasound, looking at uh, limbs um, is part of the workup uh, of these babies prior to surgery. And we also have to think of if it's if a primary repair is not possible, uh, we have to think about feeding the child at some point and whether we should supplement with parenteral nutrition uh, prior to surgery or if the surgery is not possible at that point. Uh, so, so Sharina, if, if you have been called to uh, the uh, the OT when when the child is being uh, you know delivered maybe the LSCS is going on. So you take the baby up. So now what is what are your thought processes? Would you go for an elective ventilation? Would you assess the child and then think about it? Or how, how would you want to go ahead? First? The, the first thing is, uh, again, to assess the ventilation and see whether there's spontaneous regular respiration. So if there's spontaneous regular respiration and the lungs are not compromised, there isn't actually an indication to support the baby in terms of mechanical ventilation. Uh, the most important thing is to keep the sac intact. So what we do is we use a, a, a form of a cling film or a neurat. Sure. All right. Now, to oh, just secure the area while waiting for the surgeons to. All right. Now, there, there's something that I would really want to know from Dr. Gorsay. I mean, uh, this, the surgeon is calling again. What do we do without you? Okay. The, uh, what, what would be your timing of surgery and what are your options? Serena did mention stages of operations. So what, what is your take on it, Dr. Gursi? Uh, uh, see, ma'am, uh, we can go in for a stage surgery in, in, in cases like this where you have such a huge omphalocy because like, uh, like Sharina also mentioned, uh, liver is the main thing. If, if you have liver out into the exomphalos sac, then obviously you're looking at a, a much more complicated case as compared to somewhere you can't have um, a, a liver in there. Uh, so the endeavor is to close this exome phallus safely uh, in such a way that we do not um, you know, increase the intra-abdominal pressures by, this, by too much and then, then compromise the outcome of the baby. So if need be, we can always go in for stage repairs. Uh, another thing which we uh, sometimes tend to do is to just close the skin on top of the exome phallus, just cover everything up, convert it into a ventral hernia. And, and so that we can send the baby home early and then maybe call him back once he's big enough to do the abdominal wall reconstruction. So, so there are ways, uh, you know, which you can evaluate and customize the treatment for each child specifically, depending upon their situation. So, so what are your different ways to protect the sac and what are your complications while awaiting a repair? What, so what do like, you anticipate? The first thing that we are, we, uh, as even Sharina mentioned, is that the, the idea is to keep the sac intact. Because yes. if, if the sac bursts, uh, no matter at what stage, whether it is immediately after birth or whether it is 15 days later, it's a surgical emergency because then the child has a very high likelihood of landing up with sepsis because now the, it's, you've converted it into a gastroschisis. And outcome of gastroschisis is never as good as an exome phallus. So uh, the endeavor would be to, like she said, cover it with a cling film, cover it with a membrane, uh, uh, use epithelizing agents are available, you know, tincture benzoins and other stuff to toughen that sac up till such time that the baby is old enough for us to go in for either a partial stage repair or a complete repair in the same sitting. Right. Now they have decided for the surgery. So, uh, Olivia, what would be your surgical challenges in this particular case? Over to you, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so the intraoperative challenges would really uh, be related to the associated anomalies that uh, this baby will have because uh, a lot of times, the, as Dr. Sharina has alluded, the, they have uh, congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, lung hypoplasia, along with uh, back with midterm syndrome that can predispose them to hypoglycemia, bearing in mind that this is actually quite a long surgery, um, and chromosomal abnormalities. So related to the omphalocele itself, we are interested in the size, whether it's a small omphalocele or a giant omphalocele, because the management is quite different. Um, what kind of organs are involved? And I would be especially uh, like to know whether there's any liver involvement, um, because that does increase the risk for uh, major blood loss, especially if there's, uh, there's a lot of adhesions. Okay, and of course, uh, intact and versus the ruptured set, which Dr. Gersef uh, has mentioned. Um, because that does affect the whether it's a single stage closure or a single versus a stage closure. Um, so intraoperatively, fluid balance and uh, resuscitation is very, very important uh, because there's going to be a lot of uh, significant third space and evaporating losses, and they can require quite a lot of uh, fluid boluses. And I do prepare well for blood loss. I make sure that there is an adequate group cross match, uh, blood that is uh, readily available. Um, yeah. Uh, finally, because of the sheer exposure of all the omphalocele contents intraoperatively, there is going to be significant hypothermia. Um, so I do take every effort to make sure that the neonate is uh, kept warm. I cover the head. I use uh, two false air warming devices. I do use a heated humidifier, occlusive drapes to prevent the baby from getting soaked by the surgical wash. Uh, Infection-wise, um, how we handle the lines are also important. How we give our drugs through the three-way chat is important. I actually do quite diligently use a 2% chlorhexidine swab. I redose antibiotics more frequently, and usually this is taken in discussion with the neonatologist and the pharmacist uh, with regards to the safety profile. Then um, finally, uh, as they close the omphalo seal, um, I do pay close attention to the ventilation as well as the hemodynamic parameters. Um, because obviously, as the contents are reduced into the stomach, we do expect some degree of the vent ventilatory pressures to rise. So I make sure that muscle paralysis is uh, on board and optimal to facilitate this closure. And if the ventilation pressures are going higher and higher, I will usually inform the surgeon. Yeah. So that sure. uh, they can re-evaluate their options. Um, because yes. sometimes what you get is uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, although that doesn't happen quite so immediately but they can have uh, high ventilatory pressures. And then uh, as a result, uh, IVC compression and a hemodynamic compromise. Yeah. Yes, so, so you can actually make them anticipate this. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, Christina, suppose if this child is now told, it, it's been told to you that tomorrow you have this particular baby coming onto the table. So what kind of an induction shall you plan for this child, this neonate? Over to you, Christina. Yes. What would be your choice of induction? I will, I will do the inhalational um, 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 anesthesia also. And it is also considered that uh, this child are, these children are um, in full stomach. So we'll do a, a rapid se uh, sequence intubation. Okay. Um, give your... Um, uh, inhalational, and then you could opt to give your um, propofol, your sedative hypnotic drug, uh, a muscle relaxant, and then a combination of your um, opioids and other things. All right, all right, we get your choice. Uh, so now that uh, now now that the surgery is done and we know all the precautions, Sharina, what would be your post-op complications in your mind? What 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 would be what would you think about it? when it comes, when the baby comes to the NICU. Right, um, so I think Dr. Grusev and Dr. Olivia has already mentioned about the abdominal compartment syndrome. So the, uh, so we look for gross abdominal distension, reduced urine output. The abdominal distension can sometimes split the diaphragm and make ventilation a bit more difficult. So that's something that we really have to um, manage uh, post-operatively. Right. So um, it, we have to make sure that the gas, the get the stomach is decompressed, and the and the the the, the abdominal distension doesn't uh, get worse. Right, and again, pain management is also very important post operatively. 
Uh, sure. sure. Yes. Uh, Olivia, would you really want us to know a little more about the compartment syndrome here? Com abdominal compartment syndrome that you just mentioned of. It, um, it would okay, be sure. the most impending complications, isn't it? Sorry, sorry. What was your last thing? Abdominal compartment syndrome would be one of the most impending complications in this particular case. So, uh, so would, would you throw more light on this? I mean, um, usually this is uh, when the abdominal contents of the omphalocele are reduced uh, under pressure. And, uh, in, and then this will, of course, uh, compromise the ventilation and the hemodynamics of the child. Um, in addition, it does reduce the abdominal organ blood flow as well as the renal perfusion. Although, to be very honest, um, in small neonates, uh, looking at the urine output every hour can be very difficult because everything is covered under the drapes. And oftentimes, uh, reduced renal perfusion that manifests with reduced renal during output is not immediately um, evident intraoperatively. Yeah. Um, and then of course, in the longer term, when we reduce it under pressure, it does kind of uh, stretch the skin too much and that can lead to wound breakdown, necrosis and infection, which uh, we obviously do not want for this child. So usually intraoperatively, um, if the inspiratory pressures go above 30 during the closure, um, Mm -hmm. may or may not be asso always associated with hemodynamic compromise. Um, that's when I'll start to speak up. There are other numbers like uh, intragastric pressures and uh, intravesical pressures, but we do not routinely monitor them. And I'll be very honest and say that I do not monitor these numbers uh, intraoperatively. Even in our neonatal intensive care unit, we don't really monitor the intravesical pressures either. Yeah. Um, and the key to all of this is really a multidisciplinary uh, communication intraoperatively with the surgeon and postoperatively with the neonatologist. All right. Uh, Serena, would you, uh, uh, how, how would you, uh, how would you really understand that, okay, this child, this neonate is now heading towards abdominal compartment syndrome when the child is under your care in an ICU? Uh -huh. <clears throat> so if the abdomen is to standard. Okay, one of the signs would be one, the earlier signs I think would be a reduced renal output because of the uh, reduced urine output because of the reduced uh, renal perfusion, right? And the IVC may be compressed and that may impede venous return. So the baby would start to become hypotensive, right? Uh, but uh, the skin would be stretched out, right? The skin breakdown I think happens a little bit later, okay? But the, the more worrying thing would be the reduced renal output and the hemodynamic state. How would you take care of this? Uh, I mean. Well, uh, it, it, the, 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 the main thing I think is to try and reduce the abdominal pressure as much as possible. Um, I am not sure whether the surgeons would be happy to go in and, and, and have a look at the abdominal. We'll, we'll, we'll ask the surgeon. Uh, you know, one is to make sure. Okay, uh, if I could, if I could uh, just yes. interject for two minutes here. Uh, so one of the ways uh, which you can reduce, uh, if it works for the child, is to give them colloids. Uh, uh, the more crystalloids you give to these kids, um, you know, the idea is to maintain the plasma oncotic pressure. Because the moment you push everything inside, it's going to cause edema. It's going to swell up. So one of the ways is to maintain the plasma oncotic pressure by giving uh, a reasonable amount of colloids. You can't give too much of colloids to a newborn, I agree. But a reasonable amount of colloids is one. And second would be, of course, the intravesical pressure. It's very sensitive. And the moment you, uh, because if the bladder is decompressed, uh, it is going to mimic the intra-abdominal pressure completely. Uh, it, it, it's a very honest representation of that. Uh, so um, regular intensive monitoring of intravesical pressure and, of course, timely intervention by the surgeon. If, you, if, if the neonatologist really feels that, uh, you know, uh, the urinal is going down very badly. The IVC is compressed. It is causing a lot of hypotension. Then sometimes you are forced to go and open up the repair again and maybe place a mesh um, to tide over the crisis. So that, that's always an option available just to ensure survival for the child. Sure. So you wouldn't go ahead and hesitate to reopen on, at the very first sign of an uh, impending 
compartments. Uh, yeah, ma'am. If, if we are not able to take care of it with conservative measures, I, I think we should have a very low threshold for reopening these repairs rather than losing the child. Okay. Sure. Sure. Any uh, over to you, Dr. Agnes, if there are any questions now. Oh, yeah. Um, I think there was a question uh, of um, how would you measure intraoperate uh, abdominal compartmental, uh, intraabdominal pressure? And you mentioned intra uh, recycle pressure. Uh, maybe you describe Gersif or Marie Sharina. How exactly do you measure that? Okay, that that's um, if I can go ahead. Uh, it's very simple, actually. Uh, we are anyway kept in, keeping an indwelling catheter in the bladder to measure the urine output. Uh, so if, if there is no uh, urine output, all you do is uh, you place the catheter at 90 degrees to the baby and maybe put in two to three ml of saline and measure the length of that column. It's, it's, it's called centimeters of water. So what we are looking for is anything less than 20, ideally, or anything less than 25 centimeters of water. Because if the bladder is deflated, it will mimic the intra-abdominal pressure faithfully. So this is how we keep measuring it by using a water column in the indwelling catheter. Keep a feeding tube instead of a catheter because catheter may not be transparent. So you keep an infant feeding tube indwelling in the bladder itself. It helps you to measure the urine output and also look at the column of urine or put in a little saline and measure the column or, uh, length of that vertical column. And anything less than 20, I think both Sharina and I will be happy. Uh, up to 25, we would have a little bit of tachycardia. But I think after 25, we'll have to intervene. Okay, all right. So um, this two questions takes us back to the surgery again. Uh, one is that uh, should the blood pressure fall, what are the vasopressors that uh, you would use in these babes? Uh, maybe Oli uh, can take this question. Um, usually I use uh, whatever our neonatal, uh, neonatal intensive care unit is familiar with. So in as a start, I can start with some phenyl effing to have a to see whether the baby responds. But if it persistently requires phenyl effing boluses, then usually I will swap to dopamine, which is the preference of our neonatal intensive care unit. Bearing in mind that uh, they are going to be the ones that are looking after this baby postoperatively. Okay. And the next question here is, is there any ventilation strategy or recommendation during the surgery? Um you know, I'm assuming that either referring to pressure control or whatever, is there any uh, I mean, pressure control is the preferred mode of uh, ventilation. And then uh, I usually pay attention to the tidal volumes or the drops in the tidal volume, or if I have need to go up as they are on the ventilatory pressures as the surgeon uh, reduces the abdominal contents into the abdomen and starts trying to close the skin. Okay. And another question was, uh, what would the value of parameters that anesthetists and surgeons would use jointly to decide to close the abdomen or leave the abdomen open at the end of repair? Uh, maybe Gersif can uh, you know, answer this question. Um, actually, um, I think uh, it would depend upon uh, two major parameters. Um, uh, immediately on table would of course be the ventilatory pressures. If I'm trying to close the abdomen, it is going to cause diaphragmatic splinting. So um, how, how high are the ventilatory pressures? Uh, most of these kids are anyway not extubated. They are shifted on a ventilator out. But the question is how high those pressures are needed and how comfortable my anesthetist is uh, giving those pressures um, for ventilation purposes. Uh, that would be, I think, the number one criteria uh, because everything else is later. Uh, uh, you know, abdominal compartment syndrome, drop in urine output, all those things are later. If if it is sheerly, no, I mean, sheer mechanical uh, resistance to closure, that I'm just not able to close, that's a separate issue altogether. Um, then obviously we will not close and keep a mesh. But if I'm able to close, then I would be, uh, you know, in, 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 in you know, in, talking constantly to my anesthetist, are they comfortable with the ventilation? It's happened so many times, um, a few times that we have closed everything, uh, but on table, uh, after maybe 10, 15 minutes, the anesthetist is not happy with the amount of pressures that are required to continue ventilation in these babies. So then we have gone ahead, then opened the muscle and just closed the skin on top. So I think a, a good open communication between the anesthetist and the surgeon is extremely necessary. 
uh, to take a call whether to complete the repair or, or do a stage repair and then ship them out safely. Okay, and this takes us now to the last. Dr. serves as a, scores as one of the ideal surgeons, doesn't he? You yeah. see, he, he takes feedback from his anesthesiologists. I, I think Madam knows it better than anyone. We, we work on a daily basis. <laughs> I, I have to say that pediatric surgeons are lovely to work with. They do take feedback. So now, leading to our last question, maybe for Christine, uh, what is the ventilation pressure that should be a warning sign that there is a there's an increase in IAP and you would tell the surgeon, hey, come, you know, let's just not close it. Christine? Christine, you're, you're muted, Christine. You're muted. Uh. I think we should look into the airway pressure of uh, of uh, our ventilation. And if, uh, if it's above, uh, recently it's about 10 to 12 um, uh, uh, millimeter mercury, um, we should be uh, wary if that there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure or there's a, a resistance uh, um, in your ventilation. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I think we do have one last last question here. Um, it's directed at you again, Joseph. What kind of mesh do you use? Is it available anywhere? Is it an alternative? Yeah. So there are two ways to close these abdomens. I'll be very brief because I don't want to get into the techniques of it. There are various meshes available. You can use a proline mesh, which is non-absorbable. You can use a krill mesh, which absorbs over time. Uh, if uh, you do not have any mesh available, then what we do is we take flank incisions into the skin on, on both sides, uh, somewhere around the anterior axillary line onto the abdomen extending from the subcostal margin to the anterior superior iliac spine. And then we just close the skin and, and these wounds are left open because they're just superficial and they will epithelize with time. So there are various ways you can close. If you have a mesh available, a proline or a vicryl mesh is the best way to use it. Otherwise, you can give lateral releasing incisions and just close the skin, convert it into ventral hernia and, and tackle it later. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll now uh, maybe go on to the progress of the case. Yeah. Uh, sure. Vivian, may I request you to show that particular slide? Yes, yeah, so this is this 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 is a real-time case and this is how it, uh, it, it unfolded. So day two, the sac was removed and covered with a mesh and patient was intubated and sent to the uh, NICU the liver and bowel were reduced into the abdomen and still it was covered by a mesh. Epidural catheters was in place, uh, which was the tip was congruent to the surgical incision and uh, the infusion was at a rate of 0.6 ml per hour of 0.1% of propivocaine. On day two, the baby was extubated, explaining why the epidural was in place and maintained on an IV. The third the surgery was of removal of the mesh, and then we closed the little bit of, of, of uh, the opening that was still left, and it was done under general anesthesia and epidural as well, and the patient was extubated and maintained on CPAP with an FiO2 of 21% in the NICU, and uh, later on, um, the ending was good, and we could discharge this baby. We go to the next slide because I guess the next slide just tells us the advantages of the epidural if at all we can go to it and cautions along with it. So advantages are many. Of course, the first is a very dense analgesia that it provides apart from the fact that it has an extremely potent general anesthesia sparing effect. Those who practice this know that you just finally need a whiff of sevoflurane. In fact, in the intraoperative period, say maybe one or even less than that, and opioid sparing effect so that the weaning from the ventilators is easy and has a positive effect on immunology, positive effect on metabolism, GI tract motility, all in all it curbs the stress response of the surgery. But of course it does come with a precaution. It is an, a team work. You need an experienced anesthesiologist who understands neonatal epidurals and not just the technique, but of course the drug and the calculations and the infusions which need to be absolutely labeled and in a red color pen it has to be written that this is not supposed 
to be fine. Travis connections pick mind you and nice you beds would have many connections going on many lines going on and this this is just one of them so it has to be treated with a lot of and discretion and respect the nicu staff should be geared the intensivist would love uh, you to do such a thing uh, to their babies because they really can taper off their children very quickly from here but you need a trained anesthesiologist who has trained their nicu staff and protocols should be set and the anesthesia team is the team ultimately responsible for the catheter even if it is an an, an nicu till the catheter is removed is the nutshell of uh, the practice if it is an epidural catheter infusion in the post operative period so thanks i guess we can go to the next case over to you dr agnes this is another extremely interesting case coming up okay this is a premature baby between weeks and has pulmonary hypoplasia with oxygen failure and on day one, was started on high-frequency oscillation ventilation, but could wean to positive pressure ventilation. On day seven, unfortunately, had worsening abdominal distension, increasing abdominal wall erythema, was, blood pressure was not normal, escalated back to HFOV, and was now anoitrostopin and adrenaline, and uh, has also severe metabolic acidosis. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the ultrasound suggests necrotizing enterocolitis of a uh, quite severe, um, you know, extent. Next slide, please. So we have um, Joseph tell us about the surgical aspects of this condition now. Uh, yeah, thank you, Agnes. Uh, so this is, um, I think, a very classical X-ray. Uh, fortunately, we don't see this bad X-rays nowadays in NICUs. Uh, which shows you a very classical pneumatosis intestinalis, which is kind of lining uh, the periphery of the bowel margin. So these kids are usually um, quite sick, um, quite septic. Um, they may have hemodynamic instability and we are usually called in. And, and uh, there is always a, a question or a tussle between us and the neonatologist as to when should we go in. Uh, in these babies, you know, because they are sick babies, they are unstable. Um, there is always a toss up between would you intervene prior to a perforation or would you in wait and watch and uh, review whether uh, you would want to go in with an x ray like this. Um, so the current guidelines are very clear. Uh, you would wait till you have uh, an actual perforation before you would uh, think of intervening surgically in these patients. And I think the, the biggest challenge to me as a surgeon would be uh, whether this baby can be stable enough to be shifted to uh, the OR or would I be required to operate him bedside. Uh, and, and I think that's, again, a, a call that I leave to uh, the anesthetist and the uh, neonatologist, um, whether this kid can be shifted to NICU uh, to OR or not. And, uh, uh, and I think that's, that's the biggest challenge here for us in, in these cases. Okay, thanks, Gerson. We could go on to the next slide. So these were the options, you know, that was discussed with the surgeon and the neonatologist that we either go in and do an exploratory laparotomy or we continue conservative treatment of IV antibiotics and inotropes. Next slide. So, so with, with these two options now, uh, we've called a family conference with the neonatologist, the surgeon and the anesthetist. So during the family conference, what are the pertinent points that needed to be raised with the family? And with that, oh, can we have the panel back please? Um, Sh Sharina, maybe you could take us through what are the pertinent okay. points you want to bring so, up with the family. All right, okay. So this is an extremely preterm infant who was born at 27 weeks. He's got several underlying comorbid factors. So he's got pulmonary hypertension, second three to the pulmonary hypoplasia. He's also got a PDA. And both these factors are actually risk factors for NEC to occur. So he's got uh, two other factors. Um, so being on high frequency ventilation, sometimes uh, getting them to the OT for an exploratory laparotomy may not be an easy fit. And uh, this child also has got hemodynamic instability and it's on two inotropic support. Um, so we need to ensure that the um, support is ongoing, 
even if he managed to get him to the OT. Um, he has, I think, uh, lactic acidosis, multiple acidosis, pH of 7.29. And, and, and most of the time when these babies are acidotic, they're septic, there's it's usually indicates that they're in the process of the daddy. It, it may be just a matter of time before it actually perforates. So, and when the, the gut perforates, it's going to be more of a problem uh, for us uh, to manage the baby in terms of ventilation, in terms of managing the hemodynamic instability. So these are things that we actually have to lay out uh, for the parents so that they understand what are the risks involved in um, surgery uh, of these babies. Um, and, and these are not these are just the current or acute problems that the child is here having, not mentioning what are the later complications that may arise as a result of what has happened at uh, the current moment. So the child was hypoxic and the child is now septic. All this may uh, eventually um, affect the outcome of the baby. So this is something that parents and the physicians have sit down and agree on what is best for the patient. So sometimes what we say is best for the patient may not exactly be best for the family. So this is something that we really have to lay out and, and so that the parents can understand what is going to happen, not just uh, with regards to the NEC, but also what eventually will happen to the baby and what uh, outcome the baby will have at the end of the day. So, um, so I think it's very important that the parents understand uh, that the pulmonary hypoplasia will not disappear. The patient will probably end up with chronic lung disease and may require ventilatory support for a while. Uh, so treating the NEC alone may not reverse or may not change uh, the outcome. So um, it's something that they really have to understand when you talk about NEC. And uh, the fact that if the perforates or the, uh, uh, a very large area of necrosis and the gut may have to be removed. So we're talking about possibility of short gut, short bowel syndrome. We're talking about the possibility that the child may need prolonged TPM. Um, so they, they really need to understand what the situation is like for, for the baby. Thanks, Sharina. And uh, Gustav, do you have anything more to add on to for the family? Uh, yes, Agnes. I think I think uh, two things as a surgeon that I really want uh, the parents to understand is uh, one: uh, surgery is uh, not going to really solve the problem. Uh, the surgery that we are going to do is more of a damage control surgery. Uh, the pathology may still progress and cause additional bowel involvement in future. Uh, that's that's the primary thing that they need to understand because a lot of people have this conception um, or the idea that a surgery is a solution. Uh, surgery may not be a solution in, in NEC. That's one. Uh, we are only doing what is called as damage control. Two, they need to understand is that the surgery itself, the surgery itself can push the baby over the edge. The baby is already unstable. He's already in metabolic acidosis. Uh, any kind of further stress, even if it is forced, we are left with no option. Even if we are forced to go ahead with surgery, the surgery itself, the, the whole process itself can be detrimental to the outcome. So I think these are two things as a surgeon, which I would really want the parents to understand. That it's not a solution, a complete solution, but it can be a part of the problem, the surgery itself. Family agrees and wants the surgery, Olivia. Uh, what are the risks that you need to counsel the family on? Um, so usually I will counsel that uh, by the time they have uh, come to the conclusion that they want the surgery, I believe the neonatologist as well, the surgeon would have spoken to them fairly extensively. So usually I will tell them that this is a very, very high risk surgery. Um, the child had is likely to be very unstable throughout the surgery in terms of uh, ventilatory support, uh, as well as the blood pressure, heart rate. Um, 
very like even though there is not major blood it's not major blood loss surgery oftentimes they are quite oozy and we will need to transfuse blood um, we will have to further give them more inotropes uh, or blood pressure medication to put it in layman's terms and they will definitely stay intubated uh, ventilation the ventilate the amount of ventilatory support might increase and might need different machine and uh, the child will get worse before they actually get better we will do our best to support the baby as much as we can but sometimes despite our best efforts we can also lose the child and usually i'm quite upfront about that okay thank you Olivia. so can we have the next slide please So well, um, the the family opts that you know uh, agrees that not agrees wishes that all the best should be done for the child, and, and unfortunately this child is very unstable, and the neonatologist and the anesthetist agrees that it has to be done, uh, in by the bedside in the ICU. So um, can we uh, go back to the panel, and ask them? You know, what are the challenges, maybe with Gersif, what are the logistic challenges that you face when we say we have to do it at the bedside? Uh, so I think as a surgeon, um, the first challenge is that I am already out of my comfort zone. I'm used to operating in an operating theater. So you're operating in a different place. So I think um, first and foremost, uh, bedside surgery should be attempted by centers which are used to doing this because there are certain protocols. We have, we have published a review of our uh, bedside surgeries, uh, which we did in the last five years. And I think you need to have a, the entire team being comfortable operating bedside. That's one. Secondly, is, to, uh, is the challenge to um, sterilize the place. Do you have an isolation room or are you really going to do true bed bedside surgery or do we have an isolation room in the NICU, which can be converted into an emergency uh, operating theater if required? That's two. Third would be uh, getting the equipment, uh, the scrub nurses and the technicians up into the OT, uh, into an area in NICU where there's any way restricted access. That's third. The fourth thing I think which is most important for a surgeon to understand if there are surgeons in the audience is that uh, this is a damage control surgery. You're doing it bedside. You're doing it in situation which is compromised. So you have to be quick in and quick out. You can't be operating bedside for two hours, three hours. You have to be quick in assess the situation, do what is absolutely necessary to ensure survival for the child and come out. I think as a surgeon, these are the challenges, uh, the primary challenges, I would say, uh, for me to operate bedside. Okay, and uh, Olivia, back to you. So what are your logistics? Uh, the problems that you have to overcome? Um, similar to what Dr. Gersef has said, it is uh, operating in the neonatal intensive care unit is uh, an unfamiliar environment. Um, to put it very simply, I term it bring your own anesthesia, BYO anesthesia. So what is bring your own? Bring your own is bring your body, yourself, your nurse, your equipment, your drugs, figure out where you can store the blood products that you will need and to really uh, be familiar with the bedside operation setup. It shouldn't be something that you are doing for the first time, yeah, in the most ideal of uh, situations. Um, there's no, oftentimes there is no uh, anesthesia machine, so we have to be familiar with the operation of the neonatal intensive care ventilator. Um, if you're lucky during office hours, there might be a respiratory therapist to help you if you're not really familiar with the machine, otherwise you should request the neonatologist to be ready on hand to help you, or at least to show you which buttons to press to troubleshoot um, if you're not familiar. Um, and also the anesthetic nurse should be familiar with the neonatal setup as well. Uh, I do make it a routine to have a huddle beforehand and ask who I can call if I need extra help for resuscitation. And oftentimes that is the neonatologist. Uh, in the sickest of patients, I actually have a resuscitation drug calculator with resuscitation drugs all drawn up. I keep some ampules of calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate or sodium acetate in my pocket. Uh, usually I give an anesthesia in the form of uh, intermittent ketamine and fentanyl boluses along with the vasomorphine infusion. And I uh, give 
muscle paralysis, but oftentimes they, don't, they really do not need too much anesthetic. Yeah. Um, if the baby is not already on inotropes, depending on the pre-existing hemodynamic stability of the baby, then sometimes I do dilute and hook it up preemptively before the surgery starts. And this is my own preference because I don't like to dilute drugs and doing difficult calculations according to the baby's body weight in the middle of surgery when I already have to monitor so many other things. Yeah. Um, there is a whole lot of lists of uh, equipment that we have to bring along. Uh, and, uh, and finally, you actually have to be also uh, familiar with what the patient is on in terms of the ventilatory settings, the vascular access, as well as the in infusions. And when we position the patient, I always position such that I have easy access to the airway, the nasogastric tube. I put extensions to all the lines, including the arterial line and the arterial line transducer so that I can easily sample the blood gas intraoperatively because this is quite important for such a sick neonate. Yeah. I also make sure I either pad or put some plastic protection around the arterial lines and cannulas because the space constraint is tight and the surgeons may in, or the scrub nurse may invariably play some instrument or press on these uh, arterial lines and cannulas. Then when you lose your blood pressure intraoperatively, you, do, you would be second guessing. Yeah. Uh, and then I try to station everything as ergonomically as I can so that I can look at the ventilator and the physiological monitors as well as the infant pumps. You mentioned things of are quite extensive, comprehensive list. Um, you mentioned a huddle. Maybe you would like to uh, introduce uh, the audience to the importance of a huddle, especially under such situation. Oh, okay. Um, in our institution, it's quite uh, routine to have a quick team huddle for all major cases coming out of the intensive care unit, be it the neonatal intensive care or the children's intensive care unit. And this is conducted together with the neonatologist, the nurse looking after the patient, uh, our anesthetic nurse, ourselves, as well as the surgeon scrubs. And uh, every, usually it starts off by the neonatologist giving an introduction of the patient. And then um, the surgeon highlight what we are going to do. The surgeon will say what he needs uh, and we highlight any intraorbitive concerns that we might have. Uh, and if we anticipate instability, then we kind of discuss a plan A and a plan B for resuscitation of the child if needed. So that everyone is on the same page at the start of the surgery and uh, there will be like no second guessing and hopefully a little bit more smoother workflow. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ori. All right, let's go now to the progress of the uh, this patient. All right, so the, the first operation was basically a drain, minimal in, uh, intervention, get out, all right? And we when the baby was more stable, uh, explore, exploratory laparotomy and stoma creation was done in view of a small perforation secondary to the corneal inspissation. So those were the intra-op findings. Um, all right, which fortunately had a 70 cm healthy small bowel. Okay, so I think with this, we thank the panel for the discussion and uh, we'll go on to additional tips for the audience. We'll start with uh, Christine. For the intraoperative anal tissue for neonates, um, that can be used in, uh, in the cases we have discussed. So um, uh, local infiltration of local anesthetics, um, such as your lidocaine and your, a combination of your bupivacaine, has been proven to decrease uh, the surgical uh, stimulus um, or for, um, prior to cutting. But oftentimes, it can be given towards the end of the operation as the surgeon is closing up uh, the skin. Also, uh, acetaminophen or paracetamol has always been one of the components of your perioperative period because of uh, well-established effectiveness and uh, pain reduction um, post uh, uh, intraoperatively. So neonates have a uh, much slower clearance. That's why the dose is uh, decreased, as you can see in the slide. Um, also, uh, can give the rectal, but the, the absorption is uh, it's not it's not that much predictable. So we prefer the IV um, preparation of, of your acetaminophen. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, okay. 
For the opioids, it may be given to term uh, neonates, and Warfeed has been given, it can be given as a bolus or a infusion. And recently, um, agents that can be uh, infused, uh, uh, PCA or NSA, holds promise as it reduces the total dose of your opioids that can be given. Um, so simply, it can reduce complication from, your, uh, from opioids, induce side effects. Um, fentanyl is an uh, optimal choice uh, because of the minimal hemodynamic effects of less hypotension, less GI, and less um, uh, GU effects. Um, the dose can be given as, as seen in the slide and usually start at a lower dose of one microgram per kilo, and it can be titrated accordingly, depending on the, on the vital signs of the patient. Next is your dexmedetomidin, and it's used uh, towards the end of the surgery just to bridge the gap between the emergence and the need to transfer and the subsequent sedation by your neonatologist. Although this is not, uh, it's not approved uh, for use in the neonatal um, age, um, however, there are studies um, advocating the use and safety of it, and um, some institutions have started using it. Um, the dose, uh, is, as you can see, is much lower than the standard dose for um, older children and adults. Um, for the next slide, we have the uh, ketamine, and um, it is also used in neonates, but not as robust as literature in supporting older children. And it's a ideal, um, it provides sedation, it has a paid, um, pain relief um, aspect, and the hemodynamic instability is almost near. So the respiratory drive is, um, is um, uh, maintained and it allows bronchodilation, which improves ventilation and human dynamic uh, functioning. So in the case, in our third case, the baby who is very unstable and very high risk, um, we could uh, use um, ketamine along with um, your uh, benzodiazepine or other inhibitors. And it can be started with a, with a small dose of one milligram per kilo and it can be titrated depending on the need of the baby. So um, adequate pain control is uh, really necessary um, to decrease mortality and shorten, shorten your hospital stay. Thanks, thanks, uh, Christine. And uh, over now to you, um, Sharina. Yeah, so... Uh, pain uh, in the unit, right? It's uh, it's very important that we manage pain very well in the units because it has got profound effects on the baby's uh, uh, neurological uh, growth, right? It has uh, effects on behavioral growth, behavioral outcome. So pain management in itself uh, is important. So uh, uh, we rely on on object behavioral responses using surrogate physiological markers as a tool for us to assess uh, pain assessment, uh, to assess the degree of pain in the unit. We have several um, tools uh, available in, uh, in, in unit of care to assess the degree of pain in unit. And pain assessment has been said to be the fifth vital sign. It's almost as important as the heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and uh, the oxygen saturation in the new need. So, um, so there are a lot of skills that we can use um, to ensure or to assess the degree and, and control of pain in the new need. So there are four, four principles in, in pain management that is to assess the pain as regularly as possible, right? And uh, appropriate and timely medication administration. So we may have to resort to uh, multimodal pain management techniques, not just one uh, uh, analgesic uh, medication, but we may have to use several in terms to ensure that uh, pain is well controlled. And uh, when using these drugs, we also have to ensure that we manage the site effects and we know the side effects of the medications that we use. Uh, next slide. Um, so we should titrate our pain medication according to the scores that we have, right? And balance the risk of having the pain untreated 
with the side effects of the intervention. So for example, if the baby has underwent a minimally invasive procedure, we may not use so much pharmacologic intervention. So we may resort to non-pharmacologic interventions like swaddling, positioning of the baby, um, uh, uh, maternal involvement in controlling pain, and as well as using sucrose. So sucrose is a very uh, good um, non-pharmacologic intervention to help babies in terms of pain, uh, pain uh, management. But if they've gone undergone a um, uh, uh, massive surgery uh, or even a simple procedure such as endotracheal intubation, we do use a variety of pharmacologic agents uh, to help uh, these babies. So there is a flow chart uh, that we use to help guide us in using pain medications. So if it's a post-operative care management, we may initially resort to opioids uh, and uh, uh, paracetamol together. So the opioids can either be infused or given as boluses, depending on how uh, good the pain control is. So we, we may start off with boluses first, uh, and we may change it to infusion if the pain control is inadequate. What? Right, uh, or vice versa. So they may come back from the OT on an infusion of medication, and we may wean and change them to boluses once the pain control is adequate. Uh, we don't use so much of uh, clonidine or that medical clonidine, right? Uh, because uh, we've got no not much experience, and I think, uh, but studies have shown, right? Uh, rather than using uh, opiates or benzodiazepines, especially in the preterm babies. Uh, the other drugs have got a lot of effects on the brain. It causes a lot of neuroaptosis. The newer drugs or the alpha-2 receptor agonists have been shown in preclinical models to be more protective of the brain. So I think that's something that we should consider down the line if we have more um, evidence towards it. I think there are some studies which have uh, shown the benefits of using the alpha-2 receptor agonists. So... Um, so titrating the medication is very important. As much as possible, we do not want to over-sedate the child because that may lead to other complications such as hypotension, gastric dismotility, and that may impede us in terms of starting the babies on feet uh, very early. So uh, we try and wean them off sedation and make sure that their pain control is adequate. So usually by day two, uh, we should be able to wean them off the opiates and just continue them on uh, paracetamol, which we usually continue until about day five post-op. And usually by then, the pain score would probably be about zero or one, and we may resort to non-pharmacology interventions at that point. So in a nutshell, that's how we manage the pain uh, in the new unit. Thanks, thanks, uh, Sharina. In fact, a, a warm thanks of appreci appreciation to all the panel members for making this discussion a very lovely discussion. Thank you. And now we go off, hand it over to Fauzia. Are there any questions for Shari? I uh, know there aren't. I have been keeping a close eye on this, but for the for, we don't have any questions because most of the questions have been answered by the panelists in the chat box. I mean, the questionnaire box itself. Okay, thank you very much, panel. Okay, we, we come to the end of this uh, very interesting discussion. And as you know, uh, though neonatal anesthesia is, is part of uh, pediatric anesthesia, but it's got its own unique problems. And we've discussed some very pertinent points in the management of these patients, very practical points. Just to remind you again, regarding the certificate of attendance, this will be automatically generated and forwarded to those who submit the post-webinar survey. And the post-webinar survey will be forwarded tomorrow, which is January 16, 2023, at 1700 uh, hours of uh, Singapore time through your email. And please ensure that you have correctly keyed in your full name and email. Next, please. Also, to remind you again, do visit the website uh, of aspa2000.com uh, and like us on Facebook and follow us on YouTube.
this is the information about our uh, next annual ASPA meeting. This is going to be held in Korea in uh, June 2023, 16th to 18th of June in Seoul. So we hope to see at least some of you there uh, at, at this meeting. And this is to invite you all to become ASPA members. Uh, this is the key code that is given there. It's also present on the website. And to let you know that uh, ASPA allows through education and its mission is to foster the highest standard of pediatric anesthesia care in Asia. It's a nonprofit organization and hence we seek your help to donate and help us in our cause. Please uh, stay tuned with us. Uh, we'll show you a short video on the current and future uh, state of patient safety, what we have learned. And this is the topic of our next month's uh, uh, webinar, which will be held on the 19th of February, 2023. Please stay tuned for a few more minutes. Thank you. So do we leave and go to the next one? Not bad. Well done. We're on time. Yes. Well, we're on time. Well done, everybody. And thank you, everybody. Joseph, Sharina, Ollie, Christine, you know, uh, Sharina, Joseph, everybody. And Vivian, <laughs> thank you very Vivian. much. Vivian. Absolutely. Yeah, you just I know. Yeah. One oh, we're still like, it's okay. I'm thanking everybody. Well, <laughs> Shall we leave and go to the next one? Yes, and thank you, Agnes, madam. Okay. Good save, we'll see.